Innovation and invention have made modern society what it is today. Inventions like the printing press, the light bulb and the steam engine utterly transformed our world. But there is a dark side to progress. The scientific marvel of the Manhattan Project produced the world's most deadly invention. The atomic bomb explodes over Nagasaki, Japan. But the curious case of Thomas Midgley stands out. On any list of the worst or most deadly inventions, his name will appear twice. Quite the feat for a chemist from Ohio. Let's begin in the early morning of June 4th, 1896. Henry Ford, an engineer at the Edison Illuminating Company, makes his first trial run in a small, four-wheeled vehicle called a quadricycle. Twelve short years later, in 1908, Ford would introduce the Model T to the world. It was an immediate success, and to meet demand, Ford began practices of mass production that revolutionized American industry. The automotive industry grew exponentially. It was a time of unrivaled innovation, dominated by three large Detroit-based companies. The big three of Ford, General Motors, and Chrysler, who accounted for 80% of the industry's total output. But they were all struggling with an awkward technical problem, engine knock. An internal combustion engine works best when the fuel and air mixture explodes at the optimum point in the power cycle. But premature ignition, indicated by a distinctive noise known as knocking, reduces efficiency and damages engines. At General Motors, the strategy to compete with Ford's massively popular Model T was to produce a faster, more powerful car, but engine knock was holding them back. So in 1916, Charles Kettering, the inventor of the electric starter, asked one of his employees at General Motors' Delco Research Lab to look into the problem. That employee was 27-year-old Thomas Midgley, an engineer by training who had developed an interest in the industrial applications of chemistry. If he had just stuck to engineering, the world would be a much safer and healthier place. Four years later, in 1920, Thomas Midgley announced he had discovered a remedy for engine knock, ethanol. The same ethyl alcohol found in wines and spirits. By adding ethanol to gasoline, engine knock was significantly reduced. But the production of ethanol itself could not be patented, and therefore could never generate much profit. And to make it worse, prohibition was now law in the US, and many people were making ethanol at home a situation that the profit-minded automotive manufacturers and oil companies were not happy about. So ethanol blended gasoline was scrapped and Midgley's search continued. It was just a few months later that Midgley came across a compound first discovered in 1853 by the German chemist Carl Jacob Luwig, tetraethyl lead or TEL. In 1921, it had no commercial applications until Midgley found that when it was added to gasoline, it eliminated engine knocking. It was the solution Midgley had been looking for. But during testing, he discovered that the lead left harmful deposits on spark plugs and valves in the engine. Midgley countered this by adding ethyl bromide and chloride to the fuel. This prevented lead from building up in the engine's internals and instead ejected it from the vehicle's exhaust. Midgley found that his new leaded fuel increased engine performance and speed, and best of all, TEL was cheap to produce and its use for this purpose could be patented, generating enormous profits. Midgley's innovation was quickly patented and TEL went on the market on February 1st, 1923 under the brand name Ethel. The Ethel Corporation, established to produce and market tetraethyl lead, made sure to refer to the product as ethyl and not lead because even in the 1920s, lead was known to be a dangerous compound. Lead is a neurotoxin. Get too much of it and you can irreparably damage the brain and central nervous system. Among the many symptoms associated with overexposure to lead are blindness, insomnia, kidney failure, hearing loss, cancer and convulsions. It can also produce terrifying hallucinations, which generally then give way to coma and death. And this is exactly what happened in October 1924 at a TEL experimental refinery in New Jersey. Odd gas kills one, makes four insane, was the headline in the New York Times on October 27, 1924. 
and the headlines kept coming as four more refinery workers died. Within a week, area hospitals had 36 more patients with similar symptoms. Midgley was well aware of the dangers of tetraethyl lead. He spent much of the previous year recovering from the effects of lead poisoning. But despite that, he took part in a famous press conference just after the incident in New Jersey to demonstrate the apparent safety of TEL. In front of reporters, he rubbed TEL on his hands and inhaled the fumes, declaring that he would suffer no ill effects from doing this every day. He blamed the stricken workers for not following safety procedures. It was a policy of denial that would serve the Ethel Corporation well for decades. There were dissenting voices arguing that TEL was not as safe as Midgley claimed. But under intense pressure from the large corporations involved, the US Surgeon General was persuaded that the health effects of leaded gasoline would be minimal, especially when weighed against the much-touted economic benefits. By 1936, ethyl fluid was being added to 90% of the gasoline sold in the United States. In the decades that followed, leaded gasoline would become the norm throughout the world. Buoyed by his success with TEL, Midgley moved on to tackling another industrial problem, refrigeration. The problem of safeguarding food became a question of life and death. Then, in the midst of the great heat wave, to protect the health of her two children, Mrs. Will Thompson bought a Frigidaire with Super Freezer. General Motors refrigerator division Frigidaire had been showing losses for years. Refrigerators were becoming a popular household appliance in the Roaring Twenties, but they occasionally leak refrigerant gases, either sulfur dioxide, which is corrosive to the eyes and skin, or methyl formate, highly toxic if inhaled and also flammable. Leaks of these gases killed families in their sleep, which had a chilling effect on refrigerator sales, to put it mildly. Midgley led the scientific team that in 1928 developed a non-toxic and non-flammable refrigerant called dichlorodifluoromethane, the very first chlorofluorocarbon, or CFC, which was sold under the brand name Freon 12. In the decades that followed, chlorofluorocarbons became ubiquitous around the world as refrigerants, as propellants in aerosol cans and solvents. By the 1970s, scientists suspected that emissions, and CFCs in particular, might have a negative impact on the ozone layer, the protective layer of the stratosphere that filters out much of the sun's harmful UV radiation. But there was little proof until a scientist called Jonathan Shanklin went to Antarctica in 1977 as part of the British Antarctic Survey. One of Shanklin's main tasks was checking and correcting all the data from the Dobson Ozone Spectrophotometer. This instrument measures the amount of UV light reaching Earth, providing an accurate picture of how much ozone there is in the atmosphere. There was a huge backlog, as scientists had, until then, simply scrawled the data on sheets of paper. Shanklin recalls, there had been concern at the time that exhaust gases from Concorde, the supersonic passenger jet, or CFCs from spray cans might damage the ozone layer. Being an ignorant physicist, I thought this unlikely, so decided to present that year's data and compare it with values my boss had computed from a decade earlier. I expected them to be the same, so Concorde would be able to keep flying and the public could keep using their spray cans. The only problem was, they weren't the same. Surprised and slightly alarmed, Shanklin continued to work through the backlog to try to see if that year was just a one-off. It wasn't. Since the late 1970s, there had been a systematic decline in the amount of spring ozone. By 1984, the ozone layer over Antarctica was only about two-thirds as thick as it had been in earlier decades. Shanklin began preparing a paper for the science journal Nature. It was released in May 1985 and provided a considerable shock to the world. An independent team of scientists quickly confirmed the findings. Satellites showed that the ozone hole extended over a vast region of 20 million square kilometers. The research led directly to the 1987 Montreal Protocol. This was an agreement to freeze production and consumption of ozone-depleting substances. It is considered to be one of the most successful environmental agreements of all time. The protocol is to date the only UN treaty that has been ratified by every country on Earth all 198 UN member states. It showed that when science and political willpower join forces, the results can change the world. The results have been dramatic. 
around 99% of ozone depleting substances have been phased out and the protective layer above Earth is being replenished. The Antarctic ozone hole is expected to close by the 2060s, while other regions will return to pre-1980s values even earlier. But let's get back to all of that lead. Geochemist Claire Patterson had worked on the Manhattan Project in 1944. His job was to use a mass spectrometer to find the uranium-235 that was used to make the atomic bomb. After the war, he returned to civilian life as a chemistry PhD student at the University of Chicago. He continued working with the mass spectrometer, but this time he was looking for something else. He was given the task of determining the age of the Earth by examining rock samples. He was looking for the ratio of uranium to lead inside old rocks, then using the rate of radioactive decay to determine the age of the sample. It was tedious work, and to make matters worse, the numbers didn't add up. And by this time, you probably know why. He was finding too much lead. He tried to remove lead contamination from his samples. He scrubbed every piece of equipment, too much lead. He used distilled water, too much lead. He even tested blank samples that should contain no lead at all. He still found lead. It took Patterson years just to assemble suitable, uncontaminated samples. But in 1953, he traveled to Argonne National Laboratory in Illinois to use their mass spectrometer, and he got his result. He had found the age of the Earth. It's 4.5 billion years old, by the way. Now it was time to turn to the problem that had plagued him over the last few years. Where was all that lead coming from? In 1964, he began drilling for ice cores. Snowfall in places like Greenland accumulates into discrete annual layers. By counting back through these layers and measuring the amount of lead in each, he could work out global lead concentrations at any given time for hundreds or even thousands of years. What Patterson found was that before 1923, there was almost no lead in the atmosphere. And since that time, its level had climbed steadily and dangerously. Patterson stumbled on data about leaded gasoline, and the numbers correlated. Lead contamination had rocketed as car ownership and leaded gasoline consumption had boomed. Patterson published his work, but the Ethel Corporation, the company Thomas Midgley had helped to found, had their own expert, who refuted Patterson's findings. Robert Keogh was hired to make TEL safer in factories. He'd rise to become the singular scientific authority on the safety of leaded gasoline. He supervised a research laboratory that received bottomless funding from a web of corporations such as General Motors, DuPont, and of course, the Ethel Corporation. It was a huge conflict of interest. When data threatened his client's bottom line, Kehoe would block the publication or refute its findings. But the amount of evidence was quickly becoming overwhelming. At around the same time Patterson was calculating the age of the Earth, a pediatrician in Philadelphia called Herbert Needleman grew concerned about lead poisoning in infants. Its principal causes were then thought to be lead-based paints and water supplied through lead piping. But in 1972, Needleman, now at Harvard Medical School, began investigating the possible contribution from automobile exhausts. Needleman collected and analyzed discarded milk teeth from thousands of children who lived in locations with differing levels of exposure to traffic fumes. Correlating this data with further information about these children's school careers produced shocking results. Needleman found that children in traffic-choked urban environments had lead levels up to five times higher than children in leafy suburbs. Furthermore, the average IQ scores of the more lead-exposed children were four points lower, and their educational and disciplinary records were significantly worse. This was the evidence that would spell the end of tetraethyl lead. Two independent and shocking studies were published, each complementing Needleman's findings. The paper showed that children with higher blood lead levels had lower IQs. Congress passed the Clean Air Act and the EPA was established. And one of its first mandates was a reduction of lead content in all grades of gasoline. When the EPA regulations went live in 1976, lead in the atmosphere plummeted, just as Claire Patterson had predicted. But where was Thomas Midgley during all of this? The calamitous inventor died in 1944, 
long before the pervasive dangers of tetraethyl lead and CFCs were fully known. But before his death, he had one more invention that would also go horribly wrong. In 1940, Midgley contracted polio, and he developed a harness system of ropes and pulleys to help him maneuver and get out of bed. On November 2nd, 1944, he became entangled in the ropes and died of strangulation at the age of 55. Looking back on the career of Thomas Midgley, one might wonder, did he know just how much damage he was doing to the planet and to the well-being of every single person living on it? In the case of CFCs, he believed them to be less harmful than exploding refrigerators. I think it would be unfair to criticize Midgley for his work on CFCs, says author Tom Jackson. They were an inelegant solution to a commercial problem, but one that Midgley and others thought were safe. On the other hand, the toxic effects of lead were already well known in the 1920s when he developed leaded fuel. He must have been aware of the possible health damage, but he went ahead anyway and secured his place as history's most dangerous inventor. <laughs>